Welcome to our April 2024 Wild Ones River City program. My name is Linda Gary, and I'm the president of uh, the River City chapter for this year. For those of you who are new to Wild Ones, we are a local chapter of a national organization. We are a nonprofit that focuses on increasing biodiversity through native plant landscaping. Our stated mission is to connect people and native plants for a healthy planet. Okay, so now many of you may already know this, but April is actually Native Plant Month. I wanna share a couple of quotes about native plants that I saw this week. This is from the National Wildlife Federation. These organisms, native plants, are indigenous to the regions where they have evolved over thousands of years, and they form the basis for an ecosystem's food web. Native plants support native insects, native insects pollinate native plants, and native plants and insects feed other animals, including humans. On the other hand, using non-natives that haven't evolved along with their ecosystems can cause more harm than good, leaving the diets of resident critters unmet while competing for resources and potentially pushing out beneficial native plants. Another quote I saw from the Homegrown National Park website, Dr. Doug Tallamy says, in the past, we have asked one thing of our gardens, that they be pretty, but now they have to support life, sequester carbon, feed pollinators, and manage water. So native plants, as you guys all know, are so important. Um, so I hope that you will go out there and celebrate Native Plant Month this, this month, this April, and share your knowledge with someone who doesn't know just how important our native plants are. All right, so in our past Zoom webinars, we've had folks from all over West Michigan, as well as the rest of the state and the rest of the country. So if you want, we've asked people to um, put your location in the chat box, and then we can kind of see where everyone is coming from. It's always, it's kind of fun to see that. Before we move into our program, I want to remind you that spring is the beginning of the season for native plant sales. If you have some space in your garden or are planting a whole new area, now is a great time to find those native plants that you need. On our website, under the resources tab, you can find a document called Local Michigan Native Plant Sources. And it has lots of information on where and when spring sales are happening and um, in the spring and this summer too. So included in that list is the Wild Ones River City Annual Native Plant Sale in July. And um, we will also have a booth at the Fulton Street Farmers Market several times this summer in collaboration with the Native Plant Guild. So if you need to buy some native plants, come see us at the Farmers Market or um, order some through our July sale. If you don't live in this area, check out the Wild Ones chapter near you because they will probably be having a sale or they will know of sales in the area. All right, so... One last thing, we have a lot of volunteer opportunities in the next few months. Many of you received an email this week about all of the outreach programs um, where we will be staffing an information table. We need volunteers just like you to share your enthusiasm about native plants and about wild ones with folks at these events. So another type of volunteer opportunity that's happening that's starting this week is at the Native Plant Education Garden. We have work days every month at the MPEG, we call it, Native Plant Education Garden. And um, there we get to weed and we get to dig in the dirt and we talk and learn lots of things from each other as well as from Amy and Karen who are our garden co-chairs. Our first work day of the year is this Wednesday from 10 to 12. So details about the outreach events and at the garden workdays are all on our website under the volunteer tab. I hope you'll check it out and find an event that fits into your calendar and volunteer. It's a lot of fun and it's a great way to meet people and to learn new things. Okay, last thing, before we introduce our speaker, I'm gonna go through the housekeeping things again. You guys probably all know this also. So there's a whole row of buttons at the bottom of your screen, and but there's two of them I want you to notice especially. The chat button is where you can type in comments during the presentation, and that's also where we will post links to um, maybe some websites um, that correlate with this program. 
we are going to post the link to the local Michigan Native Plant Sources document on the chat in the chat tonight, and you can also find that document on our website. The Q and A button is for you to type in questions that you would like Rachel to answer at the end of her presentation. And lastly, you will receive an email in a couple of days with a link to the YouTube recording of this program. And you're welcome to pass it on to anyone who you think would enjoy it. That's all I've got for now. Um, Linda Schuster, our program committee co-chair will now introduce our speaker. Linda. Thank you, Linda. I am pleased to introduce our speaker tonight. Rachel, Rachel Leonard is a rain gardener and outreach assistant for the Washtenaw County Water Resources Commissioner's Environmental Program. Rachel holds master's degrees in landscape architecture and urban planning from the University of Michigan, where her research centered on the use of green stormwater infrastructure for neighborhood revitalization in Detroit. In her current position, Rachel specializes in rain garden management and design with native plants. She lives in Ypsilanti with her husband, Beagle, and five-month-old son, and has two rain gardens at home. And I would like to add that the Washtenaw County Water Resources Commissioner's Office offers an excellent master rain gardener class, which I have taken, as has some of our other Wild Ones members, because we do not have a master rain gardener program on this side of the state. So, uh, Rachel, we're excited to have you, and I will turn the screen over to you. Welcome. Thank you, Linda and Linda, um, and welcome everyone. I'm so glad to be here. Um, and today I'm gonna talk about rain gardens, um, what they are, uh, how they work, why we need them. Um, and uh, I know I'll be te preaching to the choir a little bit, but um, put your questions in that Q&A box and we'll get to them at the end. Um, I am gonna start um, at a at a low level. So we're going to start at the start with the basics with rain gardens. Um, let's see here. Okay, so the EPA defines a rain garden as a functional and appealing site drainage that treats stormwater as a resource ra rather than a waste product. Um, we see them as gardens. Um, we call them gardens, rain gardens, but they are stormwater management. They function for water quality. Um, they can be large pieces of infrastructure. Um, uh, you might see them called bioretention uh, gardens if they're in a more industrial area or if they're more municipal, um, but they all function in kind of the same way to soak in uh, water where it falls. So, rain gardens soak in rainwater. This, that's what they do. Um, here you see rainwater come from downspouts into a rain garden, soaking in to the earth. The rainwater coming off the driveway is going right into the storm drain. Um, storm drains go directly to our waterways. They do not get filtered in any way. So anything that goes down a storm drain is going into your local river or lake. Uh, rain gardens are a place where they can safely collect and absorb rainwater runoff. Um, and safely is kind of a key word. I'll get to that a little bit later in the um, presentation. Um, but by absorbing it, the water that would otherwise go to a storm drain, um, it is filtered clean. Um, the plants take up pollutants and water um, filters through the uh, soil and into the groundwater, which then via um, groundwater pathways goes into rivers and lakes, very clean. Um, rain garden plants soak in water. So this is something that's, uh, this is a preaching to the choir thing. Um, uh, native plants have really amazing roots. Um, some of our native, native plants in Michigan have roots up to 15 feet deep. Um, and this creates a lot of places for water to soak in and the plant is able to hold on to a lot of lot more water than ornamentals, um, non-native species invasives, and especially turf grass, which you see there on the left. Um, that's how deep the roots of turf grass go. And so when we're thinking about water soaking into the earth, it's not really soaking in to your lawn. 
um, a lot of the water, about 80% of water that hits a lawn runs right off of it. So if you're planting deep rooted native plants, you're, um, you're gonna be soaking up a lot, lot more water than with any kind of ornamental or cultivated plant. Rain gardens attract pollinators. So this rain garden in Ann Arbor is full of native plants native, that our native pollinators love. Um, you know, a lot of you may be gardeners. Native plants are, are key to a successful rain garden. Uh, they attract and support bird populations, insect populations, um, not just monarchs, um, lots of beneficial in insects. Rain gardens take care of water from a downspout. Um, maybe you have puddles in your yard or, it's, or your downspouts are just overwhelming your property um, during, during down pours. Um, so this downspout uh, goes right to a rain garden. Now you have visual amenity. And that's all that the rain garden needs. You don't need fertilizers. Um, you don't need chemicals, um, no nutrifiers. The downspout does all the work because these plants are native plants that are adapted to um, living in this place. Um, they don't need any extra help beyond uh, soaking up that rainwater you put in it. Rain gardens um, prevent that roof runoff from your house, from the downspout, from reaching the driveway and into the street drain. Street drain. Um, if you go out on your property uh, during a rainstorm, Look around, see where your water is going. Is it, is it staying on your property or is it running off? Where is it running off? Um, you might be able to put, use a rain garden to soak in that water. Why do we need rain gardens? Oh, there's so many reasons. Um, maybe you have a wet spot in your lawn. It's really annoying to mow, you have puddles, um, your dog gets really muddy. Um, you already have a rain garden, you just need rain garden plants. So stick some native plants in there. This is a good spot for some blue flag iris, I would say. Um, it's pretty soggy. Um, and then you've got a rain garden. Maybe you have water in your basement. In this picture, you can see that all of this landscape goes downhill uh, into their window well. Uh, every time it rained, water poured into their basement. And uh, so with a little, little grading, creating a new low spot, um, the rain flows away from the house now and right into the rain garden where it soaks in and they no longer have any water in their basement. Maybe you have ice on your sidewalk. This person does not have a rain garden. They have their downspout angled right to the sidewalk and you can see, um, in the winter, this can be a problem. Um, they could have had a rain garden behind that hedgerow there, and that would solve the icing problem. On average, we see that um, with a rain garden, it will leak onto the sidewalk 85% fewer less of the time. So if you're chipping away at ice, you're doing it one and a half times instead of 10 times. Um, and right now, springtime is a really good time of year to see where your water is going. Um, is it flowing off your property or do you capture all of it? It's a fun thing for kids to get involved, to understand, um, the water cycle and, uh, you know, you can call them water detectives, um, figure out where your water is going, follow that way, raindrop. Another water on the sidewalk situation, the drains were trenched in, they popped up in the lawn, creating really soggy areas that then got rutted whenever there was a big downflow or they mowed the lawn. Um, let's see. And in the winter you would have ice, of course. So solve this one with a rain garden. We're solving the ice on the sidewalk situation, the wet lawn situation, and you're adding a visual amenity um, that is also a pollinator amenity um, so win, 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 win. Maybe you just like gardening. Why not put your hobby to work for water quality? Um, maybe you're gonna put a new bed anyway. 
um, build a rain garden. Lots of master rain gardeners. Their rain gardeners, their rain gardens are their plot, they have pride of place in their in their yards. Um, perhaps the, the biggest reason though is to keep our rivers clean. Water from storm sewers enters waterways without filtration, as I said, and water that soaks into rain gardens filters through the soil and enters waterways via um, groundwater pathways. Pollutants are taken up by the plants and broken down. A lot of heavy metals do, are brought, brought up by um, native plants or they're trapped by the garden. So think trash um, gets trapped by a rain garden and then we can just pick it up and throw it away instead of it getting washed into a storm drain and into the river. All of this snow melt goes into a storm drain and into our river. Rain and snow melt on streets, parking lots, lawns. As I said, only um, about 20% of runoff soaks into a lawn. Rooftops, other developed land. Um, it mixes with whatever it encounters along its path and it goes straight into our waterways. Sediments from construction, all that leaf debris from your roof, fluids from your driveway, animal waste, pick up after your dog, uh, chemicals from uh, gardening, from lawn fertilizers. Um, basically, if you have clean water, which is rain, mix it with dirty water, all you have is dirty water. It's all going into our waterways as dirty water. And if you're around the Great Lakes, you may have seen algal blooms. This, these are created from contaminants washing into our waterways, uh, specifically phosphorus from fertilizers and from farming. Um, so the more we capture in rain gardens, the more we can prevent uh, being washed down our storm drains, the better for our waterways. So this is a this is a graphic that um, I like to show uh, just how many environmental stressors there are on our Great Lakes. Um, Lake Erie is kind of notorious for algal blooms because of the amount of um, combined sewer overflows that go into the lake and um, the amount of farm fields that are surrounding that area so that there's a lot of stressors around there. But look at Ontario, look how, how red, how much cumulative stress there is on Lake Ontario. And then look at Lake Michigan. We think of Lake Michigan as this beautiful, big, endless lake. Um, you know, for River City Wild Ones, so I'll be on that side of the state. Um, you know, there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of development um, on, on Lake Michigan from, you know, four states. And there's also shipping traffic. Um, but we think about development on shorelines. Um, it decreases the amount of uh, runoff from in a watershed that is filtered clean and infiltrated into the land. Um, so rain gardens can make a really big difference, especially if you have shoreline property. So this is from 2012, so it's a little old, but I don't, this has not changed. The biggest remaining water quality problem is polluted runoff that carries pollutants from many diverse sources into our streams, lakes, and rivers. So this is farm fields, urban streets, parking lots, suburban lawns, construction sites, um, it, it's, and combined sewer overflows, which are fewer and fewer, happening less and less because of EPA guidelines, but are still an issue. Um, but the more we can capture rain where it falls, um, and we can do this, if we, if this happens on a, every rain garden helps, but if this happens on a huge scale, imagine what we could accomplish. <coughs> Hydrofilth is another name for this. Um, polluted runoff that we have. <coughs> Everybody knows the water cycle, right? Condensation in the clouds, rain hitting the earth, lots of infiltration happening and in, in these wild spaces. 
um, groundwater flow going into um, waterways, evaporation, evapotranspiration, um, condensing again back into rainwater. Very little runoff is happening when you have um, undeveloped land. This is a this is an image of Southeast Ann Arbor in the 1950s. You see a lot of um, it's still developed. You still have farm fields, but there's there's you know there's, there's undeveloped land as well. Um, but there's not a lot of uh, impervious surface. Um, this is I-94. You see, it's just just getting built. This is the same area in 2010. That that big building in the middle is Briarwood Mall. Um, if you're familiar with the area, but you see lots, almost exclusively impervious surface here. But there are pockets. There are pockets uh, that that can have rain gardens. And if if we used all of that impervious area to um, infiltrate rainwater, we can make an enormous difference. You will see that there are detention ponds um, around the mall, especially. And um, you might think that that uh, is functioning the same way as a rain garden. Um, and, you know, that makes sense. You, logically, you think, you know, here's a pond, it's holding rainwater. But that's the thing, it's only holding rainwater. Detention ponds detain rainwater. It doesn't infiltrate, they're not designed to infiltrate. Um, they are an end of pipe solution. So they they collect rainwater and it just stays there. It does overflow straight to the river once it fills up a certain amount. Rain gardens will infiltrate this water, um, not overflow into the into waterways and actually clean the water. So how? How do we build, how do we how do we do this? How do, how does a rain garden come to be? Next time it rains, go outside and see if the water escapes from your property. Your goal is to keep it on your property, help it soak in. This is a drawing that a master rain gardener made. He, um, he looked at the topography from Matt Washna, which is um, a GIS service we have in our county and mapped where rain gardens could go based on where water was flowing on his property. He even built a rain garden, as you can see, from his neighbor's downspout, which was um, flowing into his backyard. Maybe your downspout is connected underground to a storm sewer. Very easy to disconnect that and um, treat that rainwater like a valuable resource rather than a waste product. product. Um, the lesson, one of the lessons that I'd, I'd like to impart is that we need to take personal responsibility for the rainwater that that falls on our land. Um, if it's going off of your property, um, you can you can retain it uh, on your property in in many ways: rain barrels, rain garden, um, green roof. Um, but that it's kind of our, it's our responsibility to. To, care, to take care of the rainwater that falls on our property, on our developed land. We're gonna harness the power of plants with our rain gardens. Like I said, some native plants have roots um, up to 15 feet deep, that grow up to 15 feet deep. And one third of a plant's roots on average die every year, leaving channels in the soil which helps to infiltrate even more water so that the more mature, the more, um, the older the rain garden, the more water it can absorb. Um, and this is important too, because it means that you can have a rain garden, even if you have clay soil, because over time, the plants will be breaking through that um, clay and creating a much more porous compost mixture on the top with, with um, the decay of, of garden waste every year. Rain garden plants have several jobs. One job is absorbing rainwater, handling the stand standing water. We are not building ponds. We are building shallow depressions in landscape. You want three to six inches deep maximum. We say this because 
we don't want standing water. We don't want mosquito breeding grounds. We also don't want to drown our plants. Um, some of our Michigan native plants can handle big extremes with water um, and drought, but not very many of them can handle standing water for one season and no water for another season. So we want water to absorb within 48 hours. Three to six inches deep is, is the guideline, three inches for clay soils, six inches for sandier soils. Rain garden plants create habitat, all sorts of habitat, not just pollinators. Look at that froggy in there. Um, so we've got a monarch on the swamp milkweed. We've got a green frog in that sedum there, bumblebee on the monarda, and let's see, goldfinch. There's another butterfly in that New England aster. So you can really create um, some valuable ecological habitat with native plants in your rain garden. Um, another job is to look good. So we think sustainability should be beautiful. Um, and why not? And, and since many rain gardens um, are built in residential uh, areas or built up areas, places that have a lot of uh, impervious surface, um, you know, they're seen by a lot of people with a lot of different view, viewpoints about how um, a garden should look. And I know you're, um, I'm, pre I'm preaching to the wild ones, uh, choir here. Um, you know, it doesn't matter. It, it, it should, it should be ecologically, um, sustainable is like the, the top concern. Um, but I would challenge you to consider, um, aesthetics with your rain gardens, um, because if it's beautiful, people are, will embrace it and they will take care of it. Even if they haven't heard the wild ones message, the native plant message. And then here you plant a few little plants and then a season later, because of all of the nutrients and rainwater going into these gardens, they, they really grow up fast. Um, so you can see here that there is a downspout um, coming off the front of the house to the right of the garage and that it's piped underground. Um, let's see, piped underground and comes out right here. And so this is taking care of all of the runoff from the front of, of their house. It's a fairly small garden, um, but it doesn't look like a utility. It's a beautiful garden, but it is a utility. And then overflow is coming out here. So safe overflows exiting safely away from any buildings and the sidewalk. So there's we have some general rules for um, building a rain garden. Rain gardens must be at least 10 feet away from a house or other building. Um, or a retaining wall, um, anything that is kind of structural, anything with a foundation. That's because we don't want to put a, extra stress on um, the foundations of our buildings. You are going to measure the roof area or the impervious surface area that drains to the rain garden. And if you take 20% of that, that's how big your rain garden should be, or 30% if you have clay soils. That's a general guideline. You can make it smaller. You can start small and add on to it. Every little bit helps. Um, oh, losing my place. Um, you want water to pool no more than six inches deep. If it's clay, no more than three inches deep. You're going to mix in compost and you're going to cover with mulch. That is going to help, especially in the first couple of years, to prevent. Um, reduce the amount of weeding you're going to have to do, prevent invasives from, from popping up because they will, um, because there's a lot of, you know, empty area when the, when a garden is, for, is first uh, coming um, into maturation. 
And then you're going to want a safe overflow. So say you undersized your rain garden because that's all you could afford to fill in that year. Um, that's fine. As long as you have a, a place for the over it to overflow safely, not at a sidewalk, not at your um, neighbor's house um, uh, and not towards your own house. And a very important rule is you want the right plant for the right place. You put plants that want wet in the base of the rain garden. You want plants that want dry around the sides and the berm. Um, you want plants that can handle those ups and downs um, where those ups and downs are gonna happen. Really, you want shade plants for a shady rain garden. You want plants that can handle sun for sun. Um, and you want plants that are native in your local region. So this is how you're gonna construct a rain garden. You want it to be flat on the bottom, like a bathtub. Um, if it's a bowl, it will pool just in the middle. If it's flat all along the bottom, you'll have a consistent um, layer of water and it will infiltrate faster. And you're building a berm and you're cutting a notch in the berm for an overflow. I'll show a picture of that a bit later. You're mending the soil with compost. Um, this is gonna keep your plants, give your plants the boost they need to get started um, in your garden. And then once they get established, they kind of make their own compost. Compost can also be used as a mulch. Safe overflow. So that picture on the top right, you do not want water just filling out over all of the edges of your rain garden when it fills up. You want a safe and controlled um, place for it to overflow. Not towards your house. So there are three zones in a rain garden. You have the long, the large flat bottom. That is where you're gonna put your wet, wettest loving plants. Um, on the sides, the side slopes, that's where you're gonna put plants that like it moist, but not too wet. Um, and on the berm, or on the edges, that's where you're gonna put your plants that like drier soils, drier conditions. In this uh, graphic, you can also see that they dug out the rain garden uphill and then pushed that soil downhill to build the berm. So they weren't moving the soil for very far. So if you're building on a, on a hill, that can be kind of a, an advantage. I'm gonna go through some plant possibilities because I know people love this part. Um, some examples of plants that do well in the wet water zone. Um, sensitive fern. This is a lovely fern that has um, broader fronds than the ostrich fern that many people see. Um, and it doesn't get as dried out as ostrich fern, but this does well in the wetter zones and it does well in kind of low light situations as well. Wild iris, this, um, Blue flag iris is, is, is uh, actually what it's more commonly called, um, southern blue, black, blue flag iris. This plant is a workhorse. We use this all the time in our rain gardens. Um, it looks good all year long, <laughs> like I swear. Um, in, in the winter, you barely see it, but like the, the foliage, those, those spiky green leaves, they leave an impression. Um, even when the, the plant isn't flowering. Um, fox sedge is also a great workhouse horse plant. Um, you can see on the lower right, um, that is all fox sedge. So say, you know, you don't want a lot of variety where wherever you're building your, your rain garden, you can use a monochromatic palette and it will still function well as a rain garden. It won't be as, as ecologically um, diverse, but this is still a native sedge, so it's still a valuable species. And on the lower left, you can see the fern and the blue flag iris look just looking lovely together. 
Um, the bottom of the rain garden, um, if you have full sun conditions, um, there are a lot of options um, for the bottom of the rain garden in full sun. There are a lot of full sun um, options in general because a lot of the plants that we use in rain gardens are prairie species that get a lot of sun. Um, New England aster. Um, there's a native R of New England aster, purple dome. That one blooms a little bit shorter. Um, it's still considered um, native because of uh, it comes from the native New England aster, which is a native R, native cultivar. We have switchgrass. We use that all the time. It, it, it's beautiful in the fall um, with the turning this rusty red. Um, purple coneflower, uh, um, echinacea is another another name for this one. Echinacea purpurea, swamp milkweed. These these do all do really well um, in sun, in the wetter areas of your rain garden. And these are big pollinator plants. Bees love these. Butterflies love these swamp milkweed, especially if you want to support monarch populations. Prairie dock. This is a really fun plant. The, the leaves are enormous and um, they just have a really nice texture uh, all, all the growing season long. And they send out these eight foot um, stalks with flowers on them, um, these beautiful yellow flowers on them. Um, and when they're done blooming, you still have this gorgeous giant leaves to look at. Joe pie weed, false sunflower, um, turtle head, um, the liatris species. This might be a marsh liatris. I'm not exactly sure. Um, but those are all beautiful flowering plants that do well in the bottom of the rain garden. If you have shady conditions, you can still have flowers. Cardinal flower and blue globelia both do really well the, um, in part shade conditions. <coughs> Cardinal flower does well in full shade even. <coughs> Excuse me. Having some technical difficulties. <laughs> Wild iris or blue flag iris. Notice how it was, it's also in shade. It does well in shade, it does well in the sun, it does well in a garden that gets a ton of water, it gets well, well it does well in a garden that gets, you know, less, a lot less water and can handle periods of drought, wild blue, blue flag iris. I will, I can't tell you enough how, how good this plant does in rain gardens. Culver's root. This is a tall plant, gets up to five feet, six feet tall and has really fun, like spires of white flowers, um, early meadow root and maiden hair fern, ostrich fern, just other like beautiful foliage plants that do well in shade. <coughs> I would say ostrich fern can do well in the bottom of your rain garden. Will also do great on the sides or in the berm. Your side slopes that are not getting as much water, but they still get some some wetness during oh, during um, large downpours. Canada anemone, and I say beware here. And those of you who have planted Canada anemone know what I mean. This plant will take over. So if you don't have a lot of time to weed, you don't have a lot of energy to devote to your rain garden. Plant this plant. It will take over and outcompete every weed <laughs> and also every other plant. Um, so that's a great one if you have like a large area and you just want to 
you don't want to manage manage it as much as um, a more formal garden. Um, Rebecca, yeah, so these are the black eyed Susans, um, nodding wild onion. This is the cutest plant. It makes these, you know, it like any allium makes these spherical um, sprays of, of flowers. Wild strawberry. This is also a creeper that can also take over. Um, so, you know, I, I have it because I want it to take over. <laughs> um, and, and you do actually get strawberries with this plant, which is wonderful for wildlife and also for kids um, or for yourself. Um, Baptisia, so this is your blue wild indigo, indigo and white wild indigo. This plant um, does well in sun and masses in like a big bushy form. So it almost looks like a shrub when it's fully um, developed. Prairie do drop seed, this is one of our native prairie grasses. Um, with a really nice form as well. Um, shade, um, sea can and anemone. This is almost like uh, the blue flag iris. Um, is, it just does well everywhere, but it spreads a lot more than blue flag iris. So wild geranium is another lovely ground cover. It's It doesn't get very tall, maybe a foot tall. Um, lovely flowers um, and, and just does a nice job at um, creating a, a covering the ground in your rain garden to reduce the amount of weeds that can pop up. Wild columbine, this does really well in the shade. <coughs> wild strawberry again and um, wild ginger. <coughs> Pardon me for not being used to talking this much lately. <laughs> Wild ginger is a lovely ground cover. Um, it forms a thick mat of these heart-shaped leaves. Um, and this is one of my favorites to use in shade gardens. Shrubs and trees, they don't all have to be perennials. A lot of the shrubs and trees I like for their winter interests, like red twig dogwood, um, which if you trim, prune, um, you can maintain that bright red twig um, every year. Um, uh, the older growth will turn brownish um, over time, but the new year's growth is always this bright red. Elderberry, um, is a great bird resource <clears throat> throughout the winter. It also has lovely flowers. Um, potentilla, so this, um, or sink foil. This is also a, just a nice shrubby, this one you, likes to be pruned or it tends to look a little bit leggy, um, but lovely yellow flowers. Arrowwood viburnum. Um, a lot of the viburnums would do well in a rain garden, but this plant, especially, I, I love uh, the shape of the leaves on this plant. Um, and uh, the little berries are just adorable and a great wildlife resource. Breadbud, yes, you see it everywhere. Um, it is a native plant and it's a crowd pleaser. Um, it's, it's, and it has lovely spring blossoms. Um, <clears throat> I have one in my yard um, that just popped up. It volunteered, and I thought, why not? Nine bark is another um, really good rain garden plant. Um, can handle a lot of variations in water. Um, can handle periods of drought, and it also has lovely flowers and lovely foliage. So. This is an example of um, a rain garden um, by designed and built by a master rain gardener, Denise Held. She had a rain garden built um, on her property 
designed and built by a landscape architecture firm, Insight Design, out of Ann Arbor. She owned another house, a, um, uh, a rental home, and decided she wanted to uh, build one there. Um, she was a big gardener, but she let the professionals do the first one and was like, I can do this. So this is her design for her the rain garden on her tenant's property. And um, notice how um, look, I don't know. I look at this and I think I could do this. My husband could do this. Like anybody could do this. This is, this is, um, it does not have to be you know, a professional quality drawing to design a, a rain garden. Um, I, I think it should be, you, you should, you should feel confident um, uh, doing it yourself um, because this is not the finished product, right? This is, this is this is for you to organize your thoughts um, and play with some, some plant choices. Um, it doesn't have to be intimidating is, is what I'm trying to say. But she, so this is a design she made for her rental house. And then this is installations, 2011 is when they, when she dug and um, planted her garden. This is what it looked like when it was done. And this garden is taking, um, oh, goodness. This garden is taking runoff um, from this downspout and um, going into this top tier. This top tier then overflows into the bottom tier. And then this is a berm that holds it all in and overflow comes out this side. Um, <clears throat> And then she built it on a slope. So she dug out soil here and put it here. She dug out soil here and then put it here. <laughs> so minimal moving of soil. <coughs> this is the garden one year later. <coughs> you can see the plants are growing in nicely, um, filling in. Or it's this early spring, lots of blues and pinks. She's got the blue flag iris in there. Um, I see lots of fun stuff in there. So maybe some penstemon. This is the garden in early summer. Really filling out nicely. Got some different blooms here. We've got a palette of white blooms. You can see the Prairie dock, those big leaves I talked about earlier um, in the top up here. And this is the garden in late summer. I love this picture because look at the grass. You can see that you're we're in a period of drought. Um, <clears throat> and the grass is parched, but the garden is thriving. So it's really, really doing well to uh, infiltrate water, but also kind of keep it around. And then five years later, you can see she did some some uh, upgrades to the to the berm. She put a wall around it. This does um, many people choose to do this because it makes mowing simpler. Um, you see that prairie dock again. This is it in bloom. Tall spires coming out of the prairie dock. So yeah, with rain gardens, we want to plant a beautiful one. <laughs> um, <clears throat> there's so much you can do with a rain garden. Um, look at these. We've got purple cornflower in here, Looks like, let's see here, we got a lot of sedges along here. This is the nodding wild onion. Um, plant a beautiful piece of stormwater infrastructure. 
um, this is recorded, so I'll leave this up for a little bit. You have my contact information and then Susan Bryan, who is the rain garden coordinator for Washtenaw County. Um, if you go to masterraingardener.org, you can find um, example designs, um, photographs of, of gardens uh, built by master rain gardeners. We have um, we have a, an, a database of where rain gardens are in Washtenaw County. And if you click on rain gardens, they'll show you a picture. Um, it's, it's a pretty cool little GIS, uh, interactive GIS program. Um, you can also find plant lists in our complete um, how to build a rain garden manual, our master rain gardener handbook. Um, <clears throat> Post this up here to masterraingardener.org. That is the Washtenaw County Master Rain Gardener website, and that has links to everything that you'll need to build a rain garden. If you're looking for plants to um, uh, attract butterflies, other pollinators, wild type is a native plant nursery <clears throat> out of. Um, um, Mason, Michigan. I really hope I'm right about that. Um, they're up near Howell. So it's Southeast Michigan. Um, but they really know their stuff. And if you go to their website, they have a ton of ideas for plants to plant in rain gardens, plants to, um, to attract butterflies, other pollinators, and other kinds of, uh, tips and tricks for, um, native plant gardening. <clears throat> and let's see. I believe that is all I have for you today. So I'll put this back up and perhaps we can move to questions. Well, great. Are we thank good you. on time, Linda? Yeah, yes, we okay. are for sure. So thank you so much. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, I think maybe you'd address the first one. Darlene asks about best natives to plant in your rain garden. And I think <laughs> you did um, give us quite a few ideas for that, for the different parts of the rain garden. Well, I do um, have a top 20 list. Um, and if it's actually uh, available on the masterraingardener.org, um, we we have the top 20 so folks that are kind of newbies to gardening it's like these are the ones that are going to work for you if you're in um if you're in kind of our eco region um so definitely check out masteringgardener.org for more plant um plant uh, examples recommendations great okay and monique asks for a beginner do you recommend using a design example to start because she says design is something that she struggles with. Absolutely. Like there's, there's no shame. And like, that's why we post these things, right? We don't need to reinvent the wheel every time. Um, and maybe yours is um, more sunny or more shady than an example that's posted and you can just swap out some plants or maybe there's a favorite plant that you have that you can just swap out. Um, but yeah, definitely use a template. Um, I, I use templates all the time just to start getting my brain working. Um, and I do this professionally, so <laughs> no shame in doing it if you're a beginner. And there are some in that packet, some design examples, yeah. right? That's yeah. In the master rain gardener handbook that is available on our website. Um, there are several uh, d example designs that are made by master rain gardeners in the class. Um, and so, yeah, definitely start from there. Okay, and so we have someone else who says, thank you, I'm so grateful for all the info. I'm a complete beginner. Um, the person has almost nine acres on Lake Michigan with mixed woods. Um, and she's curious about using large rain barrels to water. So yeah, I, I know a little bit about rain gardens, rain barrels, but I'm not um, not the you know world's expert, but um, we do recommend using rain barrels, especially to collect your, your, um, roof runoff. Um, if you have a large roof, you can use several, um, linked together. And then I, I also recommend having a rain garden 
deal with the overflow from your rain barrel um, because your rain barrel will overflow when we have a big storm, um, unless you have the giant kind of cubes. Um, uh, so yeah, you can look at your local conservation district. I know the Washtenaw County Conservation District sell, has a rain barrel sale. Um, and so I feel like other conservation districts throughout the state of Michigan might have something similar or at least know where to look for those. Okay. Great. So Ed um, wanted to uh, have some more clarity about the depth of the rain garden. Why no deeper than six inches? So the deeper you have a rain garden, the more water can collect in it, right? Um, but the longer it will take for that to infiltrate and dry. Um, you don't want standing water for more than a couple of days for many reasons. There's um, pathogens that can um, uh, develop in water, in standing water. Um, these, are, these are gardens that are taking in contaminated water. So that's contaminated water that's sitting around. Um, and it's also a mosquito breeding ground. Um, and then if you have plants, your, your plants, um, unless you are planting in a wetland that is always wet all the time, your plants are not designed to be in standing water um, for more than a few days. So if you have standing water and you have, you know, your typical rain garden plants in there, they're likely going to die. <laughs> and then you'll have invasives coming up in their place um, because they will take that opportunity that that empty empty space and fill it up like they like to do so yes no deeper than six inches you can make it bigger wider um if you want to uh, retain more water um but no deeper hey so kimberly has two questions would a hawthorn tree be good in or near a rain garden and then also how do you disconnect a spout from the storm drain so it depends on the, I want to start with the spouts question first. Um, it depends on how your downspout is, if, you're, if your downspout is connected underground to a storm drain, um, from what I understand, you just disconnect it from the top. You put a plug or cap on the part that is going into the, the ground. And then you have a normal kind of flexible downspout um, attached to your downspout and angled into, directed into your rain garden. Um, normally when you, no, most places don't have a downspout connected straight to the storm sewer um, because it is very expensive to do that, to legally do that. Um, and so if you had that done, you might be paying um, an extra stormwater um, fee through your municipality. So I would check if that's the case, and if disconnecting it, you can get some kind of rebate. I know that that was the case um, in Detroit when I was working in Detroit. So definitely check on that. And um, you're usually encouraged to disconnect it because they want less pressure on their storm sewers. Um, Hawthorne tree could definitely do great near a rain garden. I would not put it in the base of a rain garden, but it could be it could be in the, the berm um, or right next to it. Um, I, lo I love that question because I, I don't hear people asking about Hawthorns very often. So it's lovely that someone's thinking about them. Okay, great. And so Erin is in Oakland County and she would like to know if there are any resources to consult on her property. So if you're in Oakland County, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, in Washtenaw County, we have a design assistance um, branch of our, our program where you sign up and we come out to your yard and we kind of talk over your, your problems, give you ideas. Um, unfortunately, we can't provide that service outside of Washtenaw County, but I wonder if Oakland County has something similar. I'm not sure. What you also might do is check out your local watershed. So if you're in the Huron River watershed, which I think much of Oakland County is, um, they might be able to point you in the right direction um, 
for uh, Brain Garden Resources. Yeah, and the Rouge, I know too. Uh, um, yeah. I know parts of Oakland County are in the Rouge watershed and yeah. the Rouge people have participated, I think, in the Rain Gardener program with you. Yes, we have one of our, actually my, one of my coworkers last year just got a position at the River Rouge. So I know he knows what he's talking about. So <laughs> they're good folks over there. Yeah, okay. Um, that's all I see in the Q&A. I know someone had asked about um, the compost also. Mm -hmm. What if you have one that you use that you like and people make their own? I tend to make my own, but I also go to my township um, has compost available for for residents. I get up to three yards uh, every year um, or if they have it. Um, so check out your local municipality. Usually residents will get uh, either free compost or a discounted rate if, if your municipality has a compost program. Um, you can also just buy it. Um, if, if you don't have that access, um, I would buy it by the yard because you'll probably need more than like a few bags. Um, and you can get it delivered and then it's not so heavy, but it's available in bags at places like Home Depot, um, or Lowe's, um, definitely want, um, compost though, and not, um, not things like peat moss or um, uh, there's certain mulches like pine bark mulch that aren't, they're not, they're not great in rain gardens. Some things will float away. Um, typically you want a hardwood mulch and you want um, just compost. All compost kind of looks the same in the end, but um yeah, just stay away from peat moss, which is, um, we know that's kind of uh, degrading kind of peat bogs when we, when we use peat moss and we don't necessarily need that level of acidity in the rain garden either. And someone asked about just manure, like cow manure. Yeah, from... yeah. my cow manure is excellent. <laughs> I have no, I have no qualms with, with manure. Um, it's, it's composted. It's, it's good stuff. So, yeah. And again, you're not growing your vegetables in your rain garden. So, um, that's one thing that I have seen is like, whoa, the plants do really well here. I could grow my tomatoes here. These, these are taking in contaminants. This is not stuff you want to eat. Um, uh, I would discourage you from, from, uh, from, from that, especially because a, a lot of roof runoff has bird poop in it. Um, so keep that in mind. <laughs> yes, good advice. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that's all the questions. Thank you, Rachel. You obviously got a lot of positive comments and um, good questions. So um, I just wanna let everybody know that we have one more program on Zoom next month. And then the remainder of our programs for this year will be in person. On Monday evening, May 20th, Dr. Brian Skoltens will be joining us from South Carolina to tell us all about moths. So we're excited to have him and we hope you will join us.